Thanks, team. That was amazing. All right. Just move that. Thanks, Bredo. Good morning. How are we? <laughs> we good? All right. It is supposed to be summer. Um, and we are doing summer psalms. So, you know, let's lean into that and will in some sun. Um, all right. Well, welcome to everybody to our second service back uh, for the year and the second installment of our Summer Psalms series. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Jess. Um, I've been going to Kingsway for, oh gosh, I can't remember now, like 14 years, I think. Um, my husband Michael's here, he's on the team as well, and we have two kids which are crazy and you probably heard them during worship. Um, I'm an elder here at Kingsway, uh, which is an absolute honour and privilege. And my other major role is that I'm a teacher at Innerborough School. I coordinate the Biblical Studies program there. Um, and I teach religion, Aboriginal spirituality and history. So today is going to be a bit of my teacher hat. So just be prepared, you're all going to have things to do. Okay? <laughs> Don't worry, I won't be grading anything. It's all good. All right. I won't tell you. Maybe just in my head. Yeah. All right. So on that note, today's going to be a little bit different uh, because today is actually Aboriginal Sunday. And the other name for that is the Day of Mourning. Uh, this day falls on the Sunday before Australia Day and has done every year since 1938. Now today, we're going to be learning a little bit about the history of Aboriginal Sunday. So that's my history teacher hat. Uh, there's graphs and everything. It's like super cool. I'm just preparing myself for going back to work tomorrow. So, you know, just go with me. <laughs> um, but we're also going to acknowledge the past and ongoing injustices that our First Nations brothers and sisters have experienced and continue to experience. That is sort of where we're going to sit today. Uh, then we're going to spend our time together going through three what I call movements. So it's going to be sort of three sections and three little sort of activities that we're going to be doing. Uh, the first movement we're going to do, uh, which is up here on the screen, so the first one is a movement of lament. It's probably not something we're all very <laughs> keen to do because obviously lament is quite confronting, but it is such an integral part to the journey of faith, because faith is all about being real and acknowledging what is actually happening. Faith is not fairyland, as some people often, often cynical people think that faith is about, you know, denying the realities of the world. But in my opinion, I think faith is actually about acknowledging what's really happening. And lament is a really important part of that. So we are going to participate in some, uh, well, I'm going to invite you to participate in some lament today. And we're going to experience some truth-telling. So this is where we're going to learn about some of the things that have happened or just be reminded if you're already aware. And we're going to spend some time where you have the opportunity to mourn for the injustices that have happened and continue to happen. Then what we're going to do is move on to a movement of repentance. Uh, we're going to use Psalm 51, and this is where the psalm comes into it. Um, and it's going to guide us in a collective act of repentance and reorientation as we consider the wrongdoings committed against First Nations people. So we'll go through that a little bit more a little bit later so you have a, an idea of what that might look like. And then the last thing that we're going to focus on today is justice. So we're going to learn about what our church is doing um, and has committed to do this year, as well as what we can do as individuals and also as a community to be truth tellers and peacemakers alongside the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So that's sort of where we're headed this morning. Now, I want to acknowledge that this morning might make us feel uncomfortable. 
We might be feeling a little bit awkward, and we might also feel a little bit defensive. And I want to just say that's okay. Those are really normal feelings. And it's important to recognize them and maybe even think, you know, where might they be coming from? And I want to tell you it's okay if you're feeling that way, just let those feelings be there, that's fine. But today I also want to invite us to lean into the discomfort. I think injustice, you still hear me okay over the rain? <laughs> I think injustice and oppression against vulnerable people should make us feel uncomfortable. We should feel that way. And when we feel that way, it's important to lean into that. And then being in solidarity with people who have been oppressed and who are oppressed is actually not about taking on the responsibility fully for what's happened. That's not what it's about, and it's not what I'm asking us to do today, but it is about taking, or I suppose seeing us as being accountable for what is happening now and what is going to happen in the future. So it's not about taking on responsibility, but it is about assuming some kind of accountability. All right, are we good? Okay. Let's hope that settles down, but if not, we'll just persevere. All right, now, I do want to be transparent with you, if you can still hear me. I'm not, I'm not Aboriginal, um, so I can't speak on behalf of the Aboriginal community. I can't stand up here and say to you, this is how the Aboriginal community would interpret things, this is how they would see things, I can't do that. But what I can do is do my best to lead us in a time of reflection, to better position ourselves, to listen to the Aboriginal community and commit ourselves to seeking justice alongside the Aboriginal community. Okay. We'll just keep going. Thank you. All right. So I hope that sounds okay. I hope you sort of got the gist of that. Um, what we're going to do this morning, Dave has already done this with a, a beautiful acknowledgement of country, but I'm going to do another acknowledgement of country as well um, just to start us off today. All right. So we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet to worship today the Darawal Nation. We acknowledge the stewardship and care of the local beaches and bushland by the Darawal Nation on behalf of our almighty creator. We promise to walk softly and gently on this land, recognizing the deep connection that the sky, land and sea have to the Darawal Nation's kinship ties and experiences of the creator spirit. We would also like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and welcome all other Aboriginal peoples present today. Okay. I'm going to go through a little bit about what Aboriginal Sunday actually is and why we are doing it as a community today. So Aboriginal Sunday came about after more than 100 Aboriginal leaders met on January 26, 1938, for a day of mourning and protest against the injustices the Aboriginal community had experienced and were experiencing. It was one of the most important civil rights events ever held in Australia. In the early afternoon, the 1938 day of mourning and protest silently marched the Australian Hall in stark contrast to the celebrations being held outside. Organised by the Aborigines Progressive Association and the Australian Aborigines League, 
Some of the greatest Aboriginal leaders of the 20th century marked 150 years since the invasion of their lands and issued a 10-point plan demanding equal rights as citizens, an act that would take another 30 years to come about. The participants used the back door to enter the building. They weren't allowed to enter in the front. But once inside, they aired their grievances and put forward their plan. I'm going to show you a video of the late Aboriginal elder, Uncle Jack Charles. He's going to read out the memorandum that was presented on the day of mourning in 1938. And I just want to make a little note for anyone here who is Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, this video does contain the image and the voice of a person who is deceased. So let's just watch this to get an idea of what happened on that day. And that was Uncle Jack Charles just doing a reading of the memorandum that was presented on that day. Now, the leaders there on that day included William Cooper, an Aboriginal Christian leader from the Yorta Yorta Nation, who advocated on behalf of the Aboriginal community, who were exempt from government funds and pensions, including during the Great Depression. William Cooper established Aboriginal Sunday which would occur on the Sunday prior to January 26, to call for Christian churches to stand alongside the Aboriginal community and to stand against the injustices being experienced. And as a church and a Christian community, we today are responding to that call. Justice is not just a focus here in Carrying Bar, but it's also one of the core values that defines who we are as a whole church. And if you're not aware, we are one of three major churches. Here at Carrying Bar, there's a community in Janali, and we also have a community in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And justice is one of the core parts of who we are as a community. It is one of the things that we uh, really value. And here at Caring Bar specifically, we are committed to listening to the voices and learning from the stories of the past, especially of those who are experiencing injustice. And we are committed to listening to the voice of God and the move of God expressed through our local communities, to hear God's call, to follow his lead, to seek justice, love kindness, and be humble as the prophet Jeremiah wrote. It is our goal to be intentional and focused on where we can come alongside, support and advocate for those experiencing injustice this year. And so this leads us to our first movement this morning, which is a movement of lament. Now the purpose of lament or mourning, as you could also understand it, is to recognize struggles and suffering, to acknowledge that the world is not as it ought to be. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Rabbi Nahum, he's a Jewish author, and he writes uh, this amazing uh, description of lament, and I'll just read that out to you now. Listening to people who have suffered oppression inevitably leads to mourning. Mourning the many lives lost, scarred, traumatized, and continually thwarted. Uprooting oppression in our society requires a process of truth and reconciliation that begins with acknowledging the enormity of the loss suffered by oppressed people, an acknowledgement that starts with listening and mourning. So this morning, I'm going to invite you to participate in some truth-telling and listening this morning as we consider the injustices committed against First Nations people in Australia throughout our history. We're going to listen to uh, another video just now, and it's um, an Aboriginal lecturer by the name of Colin Jones. He's going to talk about the so-called Aboriginal problem that was part of 
a government policy called the assimilation policy. We're going to learn a little bit about that just now. Pretty confronting story um, and account of something that actually happened in Australian history. And it's just one aspect of the suffering and humil humiliation enforced on First Nations peoples. And I'm just going to go through a brief history this morning uh, just to get us reminded of some of the things that have happened. Okay. So between 1788 and 1837, Aboriginal peoples are removed from their land. They're often enslaved or relocated without consent. They experience foreign diseases and often acts of violence, including some communities being massacred for control of their land. In 1869, the Aborigines Protection Act allowed government workers to remove any child from their family and transfer them to a reformatory school where they were forced to become Christian and learn the ways of the British. Their families were banned from seeing them, and if a family tried, the child was moved into state. In 1901, the White Australia policy saw Indigenous Australians excluded from being counted in the census. They weren't allowed to vote, they couldn't receive pensions, they were not able to be employed in most industries. They weren't allowed to enlist in the armed forces or receive any kind of allowance, including maternity allowance. And over the next several years, Aboriginal children are consistently removed from their families without their families having any say in the matter or even knowing where they're going. They're placed on reserves, and often put into homes of white, wealthy families to become domestic servants and farmhands. In 1937, the Commonwealth introduces the assimilation policy with the intention of breeding out the blackness in Aboriginal communities. This policy also allowed Aboriginal people to integrate into white society, but only if they fully denied their Aboriginal heritage. And after all of that comes 1938, the first day of mourning, to protest all of those injustices and breach of human rights against Aboriginal peoples and to demand equal rights and full citizenship. It took until 1967 for a referendum to be held allowing Australian people to vote, non-Aboriginal people, to vote on whether or not Aboriginal communities were allowed to be counted within the census, to be counted as actual human beings and members of the Australian population. Over 90% of Australian people voted yes. And so it was at that point, it was the first time that Aboriginal people in Australia were actually considered Australians. It took until 1969 for the laws allowing the removal of Aboriginal children from their homes to be repealed. And the next several decades saw Aboriginal peoples fighting for land rights and access to land own and ownership of sacred lands which had been taken from them. In 1999, the federal parliament passed a motion of deep and sincere regret over the removal of Aboriginal children from their parents. There are ongoing attempts by Aboriginal leaders to bring about reconciliation with the government and to be recognised and consulted on issues that concern the Indigenous communities, but it is an ongoing battle. In 2005, National Sorry Day was established and reports were released stating that approximately 37% of Aboriginal children were taken from their families between 1910 in 1969. Now there is obviously another 18 years of policies, land rights battles, fights for recognition and support, as well as the ongoing impact of human rights violations committed against the First Nations peoples, including the over-representation of Indigenous people in prisons, as well as the continuing effects 
of dispossession from the land. And I would encourage you to learn and research about this part of the history. It is confronting and it is horrifying, but it's an important part of recognising and listening to what has happened and how it continues to impact Aboriginal communities to this day. I do hope that after hearing all of this, you can understand why a time of mourning is so important. First Nations people have suffered a lot and the ongoing denial and refusal to hear their voices on matters that directly involve them and their future is an ongoing source of pain and heartache. But it's important to know that with mourning also comes wisdom. As much as it's important to mourn with the oppressed and to empathise with their experiences, it's not helpful to become overwhelmed with despair. It's not our responsibility to be the saviour or the rescuer or the person who fixes these problems. It is our responsibility to listen. Now I'm going to invite us into a time of lament this morning and I have a prayer which I've sourced from Cole Arthur Riley, who is the author of Black Liturgies, who is doing some absolutely phenomenal work in America around the racial relations of the African-American peoples in America. And I'm going to read it out to you today because I think it is going to be really helpful to guide us through a time of lament this morning. God who is moved to tears. In a world of so much trauma and tragedy, it is difficult to not become numb. We confess we are desensitized to the cries of our neighbor. We confess that global terror rolls off us like oil. Help us to never become so familiar with pain that we grow disinterested in collective liberation but keep us from that obsessive attunement which is prone towards saviour complexes and feigned allyship. Lead us into a kind of solidarity that reminds us that in pausing to bear witness to suffering, we do not centre ourselves as the rescuer. We do not become the voice. And free us from the responsibility to feel every pain at once. Help us to discern our capacity for solidarity, for lament. Help us to learn when to stand and when to rest and allow others to do so, remembering that our activism is shared among a collective. We are not alone. I'm going to give us some time now, about five minutes, just to get into some small groups, just the people around you, um, we've got a copy of that prayer on paper that these wonderful ladies are going to hand out to each of us or each group. And just spend some time together in prayer. You can pray this prayer if you would like to, or talk about the elements of the prayer that you find helpful. And it would be wonderful if you feel um, okay to do so, just to pray a prayer of lament and mourning to God for what has happened and continues to happen to his people. I'll give you some time to do that and then I'll come back and we'll continue on with our next movement. I hope that was a helpful time of reflection and discussion and prayer for you. I think it's helpful to be given some time to actually just process that and share our thoughts on that and just Consider things from a different perspective. Now what we're going to do is to move on to our second movement. And this is the movement of repentance. Now repentance can be an uncomfortable word in relation to the injustices committed against others. And there's often an attitude of that wasn't my fault. I wasn't involved in that. I had nothing to do with it. I think many of us often think of repentance simply in the context of uh, blatant and explicit 
personal wrongdoing, a personal thing that you've done and we need to go to God for repentance. But repentance actually means a lot more than that. In the New Testament, the idea of of repentance, it actually means changing of the mind. It meant, in its context, recognising the current reality as being broken and in need of repair. And it meant posturing or turning oneself towards the path of restoration. Repentance was to change your mind. And in the Old Testament, the idea of repentance was similar. Sin in the Old Testament was seen as an idea of missing the mark. It was like you had a target, you had an arrow, you shot the arrow, but you missed the mark. You didn't reach the target. The target was the way that God wanted Israel to live and treat others. And missing that, going off that track, that was seen as sin. And therefore, repentance in that context of the Old Testament was seen as returning to God. The word up there, teshuva, it means return to God. So it's this idea of going back to the covenant, back to God, back to the ways of God, and then trying again. And I think it's important for us to recognize that sin does not merely consist of individual acts of disobedience that occur every now and then. But the biblical idea of sin also is actively committing justice, but also passively omitting justice. It's actively hating your neighbor, but also not actively loving your neighbor as yourself. And in other words, I think sin in our context can be understood as the injustices that occur from the results of a broken system that fail to treat each human being as equally worthy of love, care, of value, nurturing, and autonomy. I find that this is my most helpful way of understanding sin. It is the effects of the systems that seek power over others. So therefore, sin is children suffering from hunger. Sin is human beings having to sleep on the streets. Sin is the horror of domestic violence. Sin is police brutality. And sin is the refusal to treat others as equally valuable in the eyes of the Creator. And from a biblical perspective, sin is also neglecting to stand against any of those from happening. And that's a lot. The repentance in that is an act of obedience that helps us to recognize the part that we often unwillingly, but still do play in the broken system we find ourselves in. Repentance reveals to us the way we benefit from the impression enforced on others. Repentance humbles us to realize that we aren't any more valuable than any other human being on this planet. And repentance postures us towards justice and compels us to love our First Nations neighbours as ourselves. So in this context of repentance, we're going to read Psalm 51 and allow it to lead us into a time of reflection, repentance, and reorientation, that changing of the mind or returning to God. Some of the language in the psalm might be confronting, but let's prayerfully read this and ask God to reveal to us where we need to reorient our thinking and our actions in relation to Aboriginal justice. Now, in the reading of this psalm, I've purposefully changed the language from a personal I or me 
to a collective we and us. Because I want us to see this movement of repentance as a collective communal act of reorientation towards justice. As Cole Arthur Riley said, we're not alone. Justice is something we work towards together. And that is the case with this movement of repentance. It's not about taking on personal responsibility, but it is as a community taking on accountability and going, we are going to enter this time of reflection to just be aware of the part we play because we do play a part, whether we want to or not, whether we like it or not, but that is the reality. We all benefit from dispossession. And so it's important for us to be aware of that and spend some time reflecting on that. So I'm going to read out this psalm. Maybe just close your eyes and just listen. And if there's parts of it that you feel jump out to you, just sit with that for a minute. And then we're going to have another time of just discussion and reflection before we move on to our final movement. Have mercy on us, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away our wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash us completely clean of our guilt. Purify us from our sin. Because we know our wrongdoings. Our sin is always right in front of us. We have sinned against you, you alone. We have committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict, completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, we were born in guilt, in sin, from the moment our mothers conceived us. And yes, you want truth in the most hidden places. You teach us wisdom in the most secret place. Purify us with hyssop and we will be clean. Wash us and we will be whiter than snow. Let us hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from our sins. Wipe away our guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for us, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside us. Please don't throw us out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from us. Return the joy of your salvation to us and sustain us with a willing spirit. Then we will teach wrongdoers your ways and sinners will come back to you. Deliver us from violence, God, God of our salvation, so that our tongues can sing of your righteousness. Lord, open our lips and our mouths will proclaim your praise. You don't want sacrifices. If we gave an entirely burnt offering, you wouldn't be pleased. A broken spirit is our sacrifice, God. You won't despise a heart, God, that is broken and crushed. Do good things for Zion by your favour. Rebuild Jerusalem's walls. Then you will again want sacrifices of righteousness, entirely burnt offerings and complete offerings then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. I'm just going to give you just a minute. We don't have much time left, but just a minute to just sit quietly and just reflect on the words, something that might jump out to you. Maybe it's created me a clean heart. Maybe it's something about reorienting your mind. I'll just give you a minute to just think through maybe where God is speaking to you and then we'll move on to our final movement. Sorry, that's not more time, but I want to make sure that we have time for our last movement, which is our justice movement. Um, So I would encourage you to read Psalm 51 at some point this week, just in the context of what we've been talking about today just to remind yourself of, of um, just what, where we've been positioning ourselves and posturing ourselves towards that heart of repentance and towards justice. Now I'm going to invite Kim up, and she is going to do our final movement for us this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. I love that line about how God teaches us wisdom when we open our hearts to him in the secret place 
and we would have all had our own journeys and we'll all be on different places in our journeys with this issue and with leaning into this issue. For me, I remember going to an Aboriginal studies class when I started my social work degree and going, doing my readings and becoming aware of things that I had no understanding of, had never been taught, didn't realise was a part of the history of my people and my country. And so that began a journey of wrestling, acknowledging that, coming to accept that. And then as I've gone on, I've become really interested as I've studied spirituality and begun to learn about some of um, the history of the church and started to read some of the writings of the early church mothers and fathers and the saints and the mystics that come from many countries, from Spain, from France. Um, I started to wonder, well, where are our early church mothers and fathers in Australia? Where are our mystics and our where is the wisdom of our saints? And it dawned on me that the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people held the first spirituality in this country. And in my course, one of our teachers said to me, creation is the first Bible. That took me a couple of years to sit with as I began to realise that God has been in this country many, 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 many years and been revealing himself um, in the land and in creation. And I um, have a couple of books, if you're ever interested in looking at them, from Arnie Denise Chap Champion, and she is a, a, an Aboriginal minister, and she writes about the wrestle between uh, coming into the Christian church as a child in the missions and having to leave her culture at the door and accepting Jesus and growing up in that faith, and then realising that all of, she, all of what she was taught in the Bible and in the church was an echo to the stories and the culture that she was born into. And so there's a lot to explore there, even in the area of Aboriginal spirituality. And now I find myself in a place where I'm starting to appreciate and receive the gifts of Aboriginal culture in my life. And you can see this painting up here. I just wanted to share that with you. Mikul uh, is a friend of ours. Some of you know her. And she has, in recent years, got in touch with her own Aboriginal heritage. And she's an artist and began to do paintings. And so I was doing some mentoring for her. And in exchange, she agreed to do a picture of our family values, a painting for us. So I gave her some writing about our values as a family, some words that we'd been given, some key scriptures. And this was the gift that she gave back to us. And I can tell you all about that, but it hangs in our lounge room now. And um, so I'm starting to, to benefit from the richness of Aboriginal culture. So I'm really here just this morning to um, tell you a little bit about our partnership with Common Grace. A couple of years ago, we began as part of our Beyond Mission Giving to partner with Common Grace. Um, and they um, really work with Christians in Australia around issues of justice. And they have four focuses. One is First Nations people. One is creation. One is people seeking asylum. And the other is domestic violence and violence against women. And um, we kind of got off to a slow start, but this is something that we're hoping this year to engage more with as a community, not just as some of us as individuals, in leaning into these issues of justice. Um, so what can we do? What can we do as a community to respond uh, to all that we've sat with this morning in practical ways? So you can go and check out the Common Grace website um, and... There's so much information on there for you to follow on with anything that you've heard Jess share this morning. Um, books like the ones I bought, films. Mum and I went to see The Drover's Wife last year. Just, it's not an easy film to watch, but again, it's another opportunity to engage. Uh, on the 25th um, of January, the night before Australia Day, there's two op opportunities for us. One is an online prayer service called Change the Heart that is uh, facilitated by um, Arnie Jean Phillips and she calls the nation to prayer. 
And we engaged with that last year and it was a really powerful time. This year though, we have, as a family, have decided to go to the local, um, our councillors putting on a, cult a, 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 a Southern Shire Sunset Cultural Ceremony at Burnham Burnham Sanctuary from 5 to 8 p.m. So we're gonna head down there if anyone wants to join us. And this is an opportunity just for us to engage with culture and to hear Aboriginal elders share story and culture and uh, to stand with them as they um, recognise uh, the significance of this day for their people. So that's a couple of opportunities for you. Other actions to consider is to um, join the Voice and Justice Pledge that Common Grace um, are encouraging and inviting us to be a part of. So there's a two minute video we're just gonna watch. Um, so we have that once in a generation opportunity with this upcoming referendum. And I was so encouraged to learn that 90% of Australians voted in the last one, uh, yes. So we will hear more about that this year. Um, but you can sign up to pledge and stay uh, informed on the issues with Common Grace. And there's also an opportunity to give directly to the justice work they're doing in this area through their website. That was a lot of information, but we will put it all in the email um, that follows up the service and you can find it all on the Common Grace website. Um, we're gonna finish this morning by joining together in a prayer, but I did wanna just offer the invitation, if justice is something that's particularly on your heart and you would like to be part of a small group of us um, helping to facilitate our, our community to lean into these issues, Jess or I would also love to hear from you or love for you to come and have a chat with us. So I'm gonna finish with a prayer for January 26th. Um, if you'd like to pray along with me, you can. I'm not sure if that's a bit small. So feel free to pray along with me or to say an amen at the end. But this prayer was written by Reverend Catherine Rayner uh, and it's a prayer for January 26. Creator God, before you, our creator, redeemer and sustainer. We remember that we stand on holy ground. We acknowledge the stories of this land. We acknowledge the peoples of this land. We acknowledge the law of this land. And we acknowledge the languages of this land. We acknowledge that this land and her peoples are in need of healing. Give us compassion to hear and to feel the pain of lives torn apart, to hear and feel the pain of land that is damaged and mistreated, sold to the highest bidder. Give us conviction to name where we benefit from the dispossession of First Peoples, to see where injustice has taken hold and to not look away. And give us courage to listen, to see, to feel, to name the pain, the loss, the theft and the resistance. May we be inspired by truth tellers, justice seekers and peacemakers in every age. Turn our, action into, in, turn our inaction into action. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.